Hello, everybody. Andrew Taylor here. Today we have a special guest, Logan O'Brien. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. So today, I think if you're watching this and you're a struggling agent or you just want to get better, this is going to help you. Logan has issued, uh, he issues on average 80 policies a month by himself with your highest month at 140 policies, which is crazy. 28 years old, uh, com complete animal. You've been doing this for three years? Three years, yep. And you got a, what kind of dog you got? Uh, Husky Shepherd Mix. Nice. Yeah. And where do you live? Uh, Seattle. Cool, man. Yep. Um, well, to start, if you could give us a little bit of background about how you got into insurance, and then we're going to get into some sales stuff. Awesome. Yeah, so I was in the car business before this, and then, uh, yeah, when 2020 hit, and after COVID and everything, kind of the whole market kind of tanked. So I was looking for something new in sales, um, and I stumbled across a couple of your videos from this podcast on TikTok. Really? And, uh, yeah, that's actually what got me involved in this. And what? How'd you re, How'd you find someone? You start googling? No, I didn't even Google it. I just it was on my algorithm, and I saw people like on this podcast, and I was like, okay, let me learn more. So then I went over to YouTube, um, eventually DM'd you, and then I got started. Crazy man. Yeah. What a well, you're doing great. You you got and you're young. You got a bright future ahead of you. What did you learn at the car dealership that helped you here? I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff. Yeah, really, really just how to like talk to people. Um, I started a detailing business when I was like 15, 16. So I always wanted to like kind of, you know, do my own thing. But um, yeah, right out of high school, I got into car sales and it just kind of taught me how the sales process works, um, how to talk with people, how to follow up with people, um, how to call people and set appointments and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and you also learned that you got to go through the numbers and get rejected, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a numbers game. Um, you know, obviously over time, if you increase your skill set, that becomes a little bit better, but, uh, yeah, definitely you gotta, you gotta, you know, call those leads. Yeah. So. Um, and then what it said, I, we went through some stuff earlier and you said mm -hmm. you'd been sober for eight years. Yeah. Eight years now. So I got sober actually when I was 20. Um, and after that, I started kind of doing my own thing. I didn't want to go back to the car dealerships. Uh, just because, you know, some sales environments can be kind of toxic. So I um, just start, started doing my own thing with that. Were you uh, hesitant about Family First Life? Um, not really. I mean, you know, seeing other people and from different backgrounds come here and do well, I was like, okay, well, just like anything else, you put your mind to it, put the time in, then you can be good at it. What know? do you do about, like, if obviously anytime you're doing something, there's going to be people hating on you? How, did you see any negative reviews or have you had anybody bring negative reviews up to you and how do you address that? Yeah. I mean, the reality is in whatever industry you're in, there's always going to be, be people that either uh, give up too soon, right? Or they, um, you know, it's just not a good fit for them and that's fine. Yeah. So like, you know, if, if any industry you go into, there's always going to be some haters. There's always going to be negative things. Said. Especially if you're crushing it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't hear any of the people doing really well here complaining. So, that's that's great. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the sober thing. Why did you get sober? Um, you know, it's just something I dealt with when I was a teenager. Um, and it just kind of got in the way of of me reaching my goals. So, you know, I think it's a huge advantage if someone has that addictive personality, but you have to get addicted to the right things. Dude, I want to hit on that because yeah, I Drew, how many of these podcasts have we done? Oh. Too many e to episode count. i don't know 300 and yeah. something yeah yeah we should we should go back and track it dude i couldn't even tell you how many times the top hall of fame producer overcame drugs and alcohol yeah it's huge and i wonder what that is yeah i think it's just um you know the uh, with a lot of addicts i've seen you know i've been to rehab before when i was younger um i've been in you know different meetings and things like that i think a lot of it is just like getting addicted to the right things because you know a lot of them are just kind of born i believe with you know deficiency of dopamine receptors or feel-good receptors people like to call them um but you can get that from doing good things as well so like working out um you know helping families putting in that application uh buying those leads you know so, so a blessing or a curse yeah exactly yeah yeah uh i love max crosby on the raiders story yeah uh because he was like 
had all kinds of crazy drug and alcohol mm-hmm. addiction stuff and he clearly focuses that on football and yeah. doing good and he's a complete animal now mm-hmm. you know but yeah it seems like people that come that i talk to that are hall of fame producers a lot of them have that in their past and then a lot of them are now addicted to helping people and working and doing good which is so yeah. interesting yeah it's it's really interesting and like you said it's either a blessing or a curse um Another big part of it was just I kind of had like a coming to God moment where, you know, I always felt like he was kind of watching over me in my journey, but I had never been the one to actually ask for help. Right. Um, and a lot of, you know, people in recovery or people who struggle with that, they, they a lot of times they have a big ego where they just want to, you know, try to figure everything out on their own. And a lot of times that doesn't end up working until you actually kind of let that go. Dude, so. you're like the third fourth person in the last like week that has said that too yeah it's just crazy that's that's good it means we have a lot of people uh coming in there you know doing that so that's good what advice would you give to someone that's struggling now and they want to do better get better change their life it doesn't have to be with that but struggling with anything i would say you know addiction can cover many things but i would say you have to give it over to a higher power whether that's you know god for you or the universe or for me it's jesus um and secondly, you have to keep yourself busy. Idle time is the Devil's biggest enemy. Playground. Yes, exactly. So my first year getting sober, I went to an AA meeting every day, five times a day. That was my job for the first year. So from 20 to 21, I wasn't in a bar. I wasn't at a rave. I wasn't going to concerts. I was just in AA meetings with people that were, you know, 40 plus years old all day, every day for a year. So I re- I'm a big believer and you need a year for anything to actually like you know, they told me if if you're not happy after a year, Logan, then we'll, we'll refund your misery. So I treated FFL the same. I was like, okay, I need to build the skill set. I need to get good at this. Let me give myself a full year. If it doesn't pan out after a year, worst case scenario, I learned something. You know, dude, that's so that's such good advice. Yeah. So it's it's what worked for me. And then the whole God thing, it takes a lot of pressure off of you as a producer and a business owner, because every day I give number one my will over to him and i give the business over to him so then all i have to do is show up and put in the work do you have a morning routine uh yeah i do actually what is it? it's you wake up uh obviously i work from home but take a shower i don't feel like i'm awake until that happens um you know a little little cold plunge action or you know turn... do you have a cold plunge i don't but uh i do want one a cold shower for about five minutes Ooh. you know Get yourself real uncomfortable right away in the morning. In the middle of winter? In the middle of winter, yeah. And then um, do my Bible study. That's number one. Give my will of business over to him. And then, uh, you know, put down some caffeine and get started for the day. How long do you do that for? How long have I done that routine? No, like what's your your Bible study? Oh, uh, that's uh, 10 minutes. Oh, 10, so it's quick nothing, 10 minutes. Yeah, quick 10 minutes, quick prayer. Is that like a, um, the Bible app or something? What do you use for that? Oh, just just a traditional King James Trid- Bible. Do my prayer, give it over to him, and uh, yeah, get going for the day. Dude, so the other thing that every single person we've talked to recently mm-hmm. is they have a morning routine, mm-hmm. every one of them, that has to do with workout, meditation, or prayer. Yeah, And a lot of them cold plunge. Um, yeah. which I have a cold plunge and I kind of, I don't know. It's one of those things that you were excited to get. Mm. And then you're kind of like, I kind of wish I didn't have this because <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get in it. Yeah. It's definitely uncomfortable, but like with what we do, like the whole day is kind of uncomfortable. You yeah. know, you're like teaching new agents, you're talking to strangers, like, you know, so like starting your day, I feel like it makes everything else feel a little bit more comfortable in a way. That's legit. You got it. Do you have siblings? I do. Yeah. How many siblings? Uh, I have one uh, half brother that's older, and then I have a younger sister. Cool, man. A yeah. girlfriend, wife? Uh, wife, yeah. Cool. High school sweethearts. Um, we've been married almost 12 years now. And you got a little kid dog. Yeah, a little kid that's dog. You, a dog that you treat as a, like a kid? Yeah, yeah, in a way. Yeah. That's what my wife and I did. We, had, we got two Boston Terriers, and... Mm-hmm. They're like so spoiled until we had kids. Everyone yeah. says that we're like our dogs will be spoiled when we have kids. Trust me. And then we have kids and they're not spoiled anymore. Right. And my wife, we have a huge family. You know, most of our parties, you know, 30, 40 people. 
and they all have kids. So we're like literally the last ones. They're just waiting on us to nice have kids now. So cool, man. All right. So share with us how are you? How are you doing? What you're doing? Yeah. Um, so my first year, it was there was a lot of obstacles. Um, obviously, like most people, I started off with final expense, um, which is great because there's plenty of leads for that. You know, you can get through the numbers and and build that skill set. Um, so, but for the first six months, I was you know pretty much just you know, throw, throwing things at a wall as far as scripts goes and process and leads and just seeing what worked and what didn't, you know? So it's like being a mad scientist in the lab and just trying to figure out, you know, what what's going to work, right? Um, once I hit my, uh, you know, really after the six months, that's when I really started to figure out what my process was, uh, what my lead spend was and kind of get more consistent as far as that goes, but also like building that skill set to where, you know, my closing ratio went up and all those things. Um, so my first year, uh, I was able to hit Hall of Fame, like barely, like in the last two months of the year, I was able to hit it, which was really cool because that was one of my goals. Um, and then, you know, since then going on my third year now, um, you know, I do a lot of mortgage protection, uh, still do some final expense, but it's it's primarily mortgage IUL? Protection. Yeah, IULs. You do love, IULs? Love them, yeah. NLG? NLG, yeah. I love NLG. Yeah, they're really good. That's who, who I have my per- personal uh, IUL with, and I just love how customizable it is. Yeah, if you're watching this, get one on yourself. Yeah. Because it's a good product. You'll learn it, and then mm-hmm. it'll be even better. Someone used to always do this training. It's like if you're selling uh, Fords, do you drive up to the dealership in a Chevy? Right. And then it's kind of like that. It's like mm-hmm. if you're selling it, what you should have it. Yeah. And it's, it doesn't even cost you anything for the first year, really, because you're getting commission on it, mm-hmm. and you can use it as a tool. Um, on Zoom, there was an agent in here. He would pull his NLG policy out on Zoom and go, this is the one I have. Right. And Or even share like the screen and go, look what I have for myself. This is my mm-hmm. personal plan. Like, dude, that's powerful. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, that's a big part of it, too. Like, once I got my first policy, I think it was through America, I was like way better at selling for some reason over the phone. Um, just cause I mean, if you have something that you're selling, you're, you're a real believer in what you're doing, you know? Not um, only that, the, like I got my first policy at 18. Mm-hmm. I had a dog and the beneficiary was my mom. Yeah. Okay. But even at 18 with no responsibilities, really just some but mm-hmm. nothing really it felt good to have the policy and know that if something happened to me my mom who took care of me growing up w- would be okay yeah and that that's what what that's what i tell people a lot that i talk to you on the phone it's like n- not everyone does this for themselves it's like you know a gift and it's mm-hmm. like the last thing anyone really wants to talk about or think of but in most cases it's like the first thing most families check for you know, when something happens. You do, they go straight for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Justin Al was in here and he was talking about identity building, mm-hmm. uh, which is basically saying like, it'd be like, you know, Mr. Smith, a lot of people don't do this, but it's cool to see that you're taking care of your family, even though you're already in a good situation, you're putting your wife in an even better situation and you're taking care of your kids because we don't see that a lot. Yeah. We oftentimes see people that don't care. They would rather spend $80 a month on beer or cigarettes or whatever. Mm. And I just want to say it's cool to see that. And you're building up this um, identity that they'll live up to, but they deserve to have that praise because that is true. Yeah. Right. But what you're saying right now is kind of the same thing. You're saying like you tell them uh, a similar thing, like, hey, what you're doing is a gift. Like it's the greatest gift you could leave because it has nothing to do with you. You won't even be here. That's you're doing the exact same thing, just in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. In a way. And, you know, a lot of people, they also have assets. They have debts that they want to make sure are covered. You know, I always make sure that they, um, you know, have a trust set up too. Because a lot of times the houses can go to probate court, and that's that can take two five years depending on the state. Yeah, that's so. huge, man. Um, wh- okay, so one of your biggest obstacles you said was not putting enough into, not reinvesting enough. Can you right. expand on that? 
Yeah. So in the beginning, it's like I I came from a background where you know I had to buy cars at a lower value, negotiate the price down, uh, increase the value, and then resell them for a profit. Right. So I was also already kind of used to um, investing in that way, but and it was even awkward for me to like you know pull into the ILC and and drop two grand on my first lead purchase. You know. So, but once you get used to it, you know, it does get better, better, whether you start off with like, you know, 500 bucks a week or 1500, mm -hmm. um, it just kind of depends like how much you're coming in with and how much you can, you know, afford to put up up front. Um, but as far as like investing goes now, you know, then you can work yourself up to a point where you're on a consistent campaign and you're investing, you know, three to six grand a week. You're doing that three to six yeah. grand a week. Mm-hmm. Dang. Is that just a mix of everything? Yeah. So that's mortgage protection, a little bit of final expense, age mortgage protection. Internet. Internet. Yeah. And then, you know, mortgage protection call-ins where you're on like a weekly retainer. Um, that's, so you're doing everything. Yeah. It's good to have. Um, how, Was that scary to get to that point? Because like if you tell that to someone and they're brand new, they're like, dude, you're nuts. Yeah. It's especially if you don't come from a background where you had to put money in to make more money. Um, it can be scary, but you know, scared money doesn't make money and you have to take calculated risks, you know? Um, so like an uncalculated risk would be like, you know, putting 10 grand into Bitcoin when it's already gone up a bunch. It's like, you know, um, but a calculated risk would be, Hey, Worst case scenario on this lead batch is you're going to break even and you're going to learn well, something. Well, you, you could know? lose your money. You could. You could. That's possible. Um, and there's been people that have, you know, done that. And I've seen that happen. Um, I like to start my people off with uh, mortgage age mortgage protection leads. And I actually like them to dial for me while they're, um, you know, getting everything set up. Oh, so their license isn't in yet and they're dialing booking for you. So they're kind of training. In a way, yeah, I like to get them in training as soon as possible um, because I'd rather them fit, find out sooner than later that's not a good fit for them. That's good. Yeah. But, with, I mean, I, I could say it wasn't a good fit for me because I sucked mm -hmm. for like six months. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I you, just had this desire to not quit. Yeah. Uh, there's a, I forgot where I heard it, but someone broke down the burning desire to win mm. and like, that I just kind of was like, yeah, I had that. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's that's why my agency name is Motive because you have to have a why behind whatever you're doing. Yeah. That's what's going to get you up early. That's what's going to you know get you through all the rejection that you're going to have to handle. You have to have not just one but multiple strong whys that you're doing it. You know, because it's tough. Yeah, that's crazy, man. So, what do you like? What is your why? Um, for me, you know, I'm big on uh, personal freedom, liberty, you know, I just want to be able to kind of do what I want to do. And I think th the coolest thing about this business is you get good at it, you build the skill set, you have freedom, you know, you can go to lunch whenever you want, you don't have a boss telling you what to do. Um, obviously, there's, you know, it, it takes some discipline to be your own boss. A lot but of discipline. I can do cool things like you know, fly out to Vegas for a couple of days, take my wife out here, we go eat some good Is food. Is she here? Yeah, yeah. Cool, eat man. Eat some good food. We went to this place last night, MGM, uh, I think it was called Bravets. I haven't been uh, there, which like is strange. Really good steakhouse. And it had this kind of old, like, mafia vibe, which was kind of cool. Um, but just, you know, being able to create your own schedule, do what you want to do, um, that was a big why for me. And then also, when I started this, my wife was still working. So since then, I've been able to, you know, take her out of the workplace, and uh, she helps me out with the business, and that's awesome, too. So, that's cool, man. Yeah, just to name a few. But um, also just keeping myself busy, you know, for a lot of people in sobriety. Um, I've seen people get, you know, three, four, or five years sober, and then they and get they bored. Back and, in. Yeah, they get sucked back in because they're not doing something that, that feeds that Well, we're supposed them. to be working yeah. and progressing. Yeah. And if we're not, then it's like, you got nothing to do. You're going to overthink. Yeah, it's kind of tough. Yeah. That's cool, man. Well, I love what you're doing. I think it's a good example that you're setting. And I'm sure somebody's watching this and there's multiple different ways that you, they can relate to you and, and this can help them. Was there anybody that you related to in this industry that helped you, um, like, that you kind of looked up to? 
Um, yeah, I mean, obviously you. I your podcast recruited me originally. I just liked what I, I probably watched a couple episodes before I was like, okay, I'm I'm gonna do this, you know, because it was cool because I saw people who had zero sales experience come in here and you know crush it, which is crazy. Um, and then also it's it's almost better in some ways if you don't have a sales experience because you don't have any bad habits from previous positions. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of bad habits coming in here. I come from car sales, which is very like it's very outgoing and very like be your friend. And in in the life insurance space, it's a little bit different. And now I'm like, I would say like I'm not as friendly as I was before as far as selling goes. It's almost like service. Yeah. It's almost like service call. Yeah. Yeah. That type of like customer servicey thing. I was very much like that when I started. And I had to get rid of that because it's a lot easier to to make sure that family gets protected. If at the end of the day, you know, and this might sound blunt, but if you don't care that they get protected or not. And I know that sounds crazy, but a lot of times when when you get to a position where you have enough appointments, you have enough leads, they can sense that you mm-hmm. you, you don't really care if they get it. Yeah. Hey, you don't have commission breath. Right. Yeah, my issue early was I wouldn't get enough leads to where I would call the same leads over and over again. Mm-hmm. And then the people would be like, you're annoying. And then I felt like I was annoying people. Yeah. <laughs> and then it bled into my other calls. Mm-hmm. And then once I was like, oh, I have 35 people to go see. And I would be on the phone with you and I'd go, hey, if, uh, you know, we got to go, we're going to have to run through this application quickly because I have 29 other people to talk to. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it's like a different level of respect for you. Mm-hmm. And you don't overthink everything and you don't have commission breath. Which yeah. People can sense. And I've even told people I do everything over the phone. Our team's on Zoom, but we don't do like Zoom face to face. We just do phone. Um, I've told people, you know, sometimes you get buyer in power and they're just, you know, trying to say that they're busier than you. Right. Mm-hmm. So I've literally told people, hey, John, to be completely direct with you, I don't care if you get this or not. I already have mortgage protection on my myself. So my family's going to be fine. And a lot of times, 80% of the time, that will turn the whole thing around. Okay. So I want to hit that. So- Early on as a new agent, people say, I'm busy. Call me next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Okay, I will. I'm busy. Call me next Wednesday at 7 a.m. Okay, I will. I'm busy. Call me, you know, tomorrow at 5.30 in the morning. Okay, Mm -hmm. I will. Then I am all over the place, and they don't even answer the phone. Right. I had one, uh, when I was in the field, I had one guy. I was at his house at 9 p.m. It was was a three-hour drive, Mm. okay? He was a police officer. He had his wife there. He wanted the policy, but he was hesitant to sign. Mm. And he goes, uh, come back on Sunday at 8 a.m. and I'll sign because I need to get my kids in the bath. I was a very timid salesperson. I drive all the way home three hours. I drive all the way back on Sunday because I'm like, dude, I might make a couple thousand dollars. It's worth it for me to go. Mm. Um, I drive all the way back Sunday, get there, knock on the door, not home, call them, don't answer. And I'm like, dude, I need to have more respect for myself and respect my own schedule. Because I could have just said, dude, let's just do it. I'm here. I'm three hours away. You need the protection. Like, let's just do it. Yeah. And I I, I think both ways work. I just need to figure out, like, what was going to work for me. No, both ways don't work. Well, like, you know, where you're saying, hey... You know, you really need this. And sometimes oh. some buyers oh. will go, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm talking more like people who are stubborn. Yeah, know? but what doesn't work is letting people control your schedule. Absolutely. And run you all over the freaking world. Yeah. At all, cra- all crazy hours and times. Mm-hmm. And you not respect your own calendar. Yeah. That doesn't work. Yeah. Ever. Mm-hmm. Well, also, you know, there's different types of buyers, too. And, and in the beginning, it was really hard to identify that for me. It was like, okay, who's the shoppers? Who are the buyers in power? Who are the people who are going to say no no matter what? And then over time, you just kind of figure out where to group those people into after, you know, a couple minutes of talking to them sometimes. Oh, so you save time. Yeah. So you're just running through. Yeah, so you can kind of figure out, like, who you're dealing with. Because there's only a certain amount of type of people you're going to talk to, you know? Yeah. That's cool, man. I always related it to dating early on. Like, uh, my wife was hard to get, mm. and it, it made me chase her. 
right? Uh, it, and then I think about like if I was dating and I was available 24-7, I had nothing to do if that girl would be interested mm-hmm. in dating. And I'm, I'm like, it's just human nature. It's like, or like a, if, you, if you need a procedure, you want the busiest doctor that everybody goes to because their reputation is they're busy, which means they're the best. Mm. Like I want to be that doctor, yeah. you know? 100%. But treat yourself like that. How, how yeah. can somebody do that over the phone? Like, what are some ways they can do it? Yeah. I mean, first you have to have the mindset of your attitude is everything, especially when you're talking to strangers all day, right? So your attitude has to be on point. Your mindset has to be on point. And then as far as doing it over the phone, it's not who asks the questions that has control. It's who asks the questions and gets an answer. You know, I've had... I just had a lady last week who wouldn't answer my questions. So I put my phone on airplane mode and said, call disconnect on her end. And everyone on my team's like, why did you do that? I was like, well, if she's serious, she's going to call me back. Sure enough, five minutes later, calls me back. We get her protected. Right. So I got back control in that scenario because I wasn't like in a situation where I was desperate for a point. You just hung up on her? Well, I did. If you do airplane mode, it'll show up as call failed. Oh, that's a good hack. Looks like we got disconnected there. Yeah, so like I was saying, and then we go back, and then I have control because I made her chase me back, right? But Where did um, you learn that at? I, I don't know. It's just part of, like, psychology, you know? Like, she wasn't answering my questions. So I was like, okay, she must not be interested. If she's serious, she'll call me back. What yeah. are some other ways? Um, I always, like, so if I'm going through an application... I always ask them, so I already know what their middle initial is. It says on the mailer, but I'm going to re-ask them simple things throughout the process, right? Just to get answers and make it a little more or less awkward. So like if we're going in an application, um, your middle initial is T, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then just make sure I type it in right. Your birthday is this, this, and this. Yeah. Okay. And then you said you were born in Tennessee? Yep. Okay, great. So I'm asking a lot of questions in the you process. You know the answers too? Yes. Yeah. Just to keep that... Um, Control. control yeah yeah so yes yes closed is like you're always an, you're asking questions that they're going to say yes to before you're closed they're just yeah. used to saying yes right so, yeah yeah and then i'm taking away a lot of objections in the beginning um so that they don't bring it up in the end so good so for those of you who aren't watching this i mean those of you watching this this is huge so let's go over some examples of taking away an objection before it actually comes up. So, uh, tell, tell me some of the things you do. So just set setting, um, setting up like what you're actually going to do on the call. So like Andrew, this isn't some fancy sales presentation. I'm just an underwriter. So I'm just going to go through some basic health questions with you, see what type of plan you might qualify for. And then I'm gonna go over some financial parameters to make sure we're looking at plans that are affordable. Um, if we can find you a plan that makes sense, then we can discuss possible next steps as far as applying goes, okay? Okay. So just a simple example of just setting expectations so they're, you know, know what to expect. Yeah. You know? Uh, my whole thing would to take away objections was always is always like this. It's like, hey, Logan, what we're going to do today is find something that is going to fit your needs, which means it's going to cover your family. If you don't wake up tomorrow, they'll be protected. It's going to... And it's also going to fit your budget, which means it's going to be super affordable for you. And if we can do that, then you can't have it right away. We need to see if you qualify. But what we're going to do is we're going to fill out an application and we're going to collect one month premium to see if we could get you approved. Are you okay with that process? Yes. And then to me, the sale would is always really early on. Yeah. And any objections usually would come up there. Mm -hmm. And then my goal is just to fit their needs and their budget. And usually um, that makes them feel comfortable because they know what's going to happen. Like I went to a car. I hate going to car dealerships, by the way. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a common thing for people, Mm -hmm. but it's just like, dude, I don't want to talk to the guy in the back that wants to sell me all this stuff. And you don't know what they're putting on the report. And it's just Mm -hmm. like, dude, sit, text me the stuff and, and send me the car. That's it's so outdated. That's my style. Yeah. It's like, text me this stuff and send me the car. Yeah. Now, on the phone, knowing that, like, 
the reason I don't like going to car dealerships is because I don't know what they're going to do. And, and it's always like, I need to talk to the manager and it's like mm-hmm. this whole show. Right. Yeah. So if I could tell you right up front over the phone, what I'm going to do on the call, then you're not wondering what's going to happen next. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, and I just try to get that out of the way fast. Do yeah. you, is that what you do? Exactly. And I like the point you made too there before, you know, hop into applications. Like, Hey, I mean, don't get too excited. This isn't something we can necessarily like buy today, even if we wanted to, just because the carrier has to think about you. Yeah. Right. So all we're going to do today is, and then so on and so forth. So. And then I've always like thrown in like, Hey, so if we do get you approved, you do qualify. Then when you, you know, you go to sleep mm-hmm. at night, you'll know if you don't wake up your kid, your two kids and your family are going to have a roof over their head. And that's the whole point of doing this. And it's something that most people don't do, which is really cool that you're, looking out for your family and you want to do something like this, like I'm detailed. It's not, they're going to give you 42,000 if you die and you're going to pay $20 a month. There's a big difference between those two things. Do you do anything like expanding on things like that? Uh, If I need to. Yeah. So like some people you talk to are going to have a hard time um, realizing they're going to die someday. So it's not um, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, and I understand this is the last thing you know. Like I said earlier, is most families want to talk about, but um, you know none of us are getting out of your life, right? So it's it's a it's a matter of when and if you know you want to make sure that your son, your daughter, your wife is financially taken care of, because the last thing they need while they're grieving is financial pressure, right? Yeah, so I'll say something along those lines if they're yeah. having trouble grasping and sometimes you have to walk people through that you know because no one's ever talked to them about it they've they've never thought about it i mean yeah i guess so yeah Yeah. but a lot of this is timing that's why i think any lead's a good lead because like somebody could just have somebody pass away that they know Mm -hmm. um or they can have social media which scares the crap out of everybody really like because all this crazy stuff pops up Mm -hmm. um but a lot of it's just timing so someone may not have been as interested in it three months ago, but they are now because their neighbor went to the hospital last night or mm-hmm. whatever it is. Have you found that timing to be big? Yeah, timing's huge. Um, I mean, sometimes the wise stronger with age leads than brand new ones. Yeah. Just because they've had more time to realize it and then think about it. Yeah. You know. That's cool. Um, okay, Are you do, do you do any other investing or are you mainly investing in building your agency? So I'm the type of guy I'm like, hundred percent all in on one thing, I which like that. it's sometimes a downside, but, um, no, I like to focus on one thing and get really good at one thing. And, and if they were like, okay, I want to run through this. Okay. Let's say you're a struggling real estate agent. Okay. You could get your life insurance license. How hard is it to get? It's easier than a real estate license in most States. And then they can work part-time or full-time. Yeah. And then they join you on zoom. Mm-hmm. You show them how to get leads. Yep. How much money do they, do they need to start technically? I mean, if they're the right person, I'll start them with leads. If they're, so if they're hungry, you'll start them with leads. Yeah. So they don't need any leads. Okay. They work. They can make their own schedule, part-time, mm-hmm. full-time, work from home on Zoom with you Yeah. in a virtual office. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. So my favorite days are Sunday and Saturday. Okay. Now they could work Hawaii. They could work all these different states. Yep. They can work different time zones around their schedule. Mm-hmm. And so they have that. Now you can be, you don't even have to, like, technically, like, this is the first thing that came to my mind when virtual came out. You could be disabled. You could have a headset on. You could have, let's say you got, you can't be in your industry because you hurt your back. Mm-hmm. You can have a headset on. You could be calling people. You can help people. Dude, somebody was in the hospital bed making sales and tape video recording it. I I'm believe like, it. Crazy. So the opportunity is huge, okay? Yeah. So let's talk. You can help them with that. Now, if they wanted to build an agency, then they could also recruit people. They can make an override. What does that look like? How does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's, it's obviously something... Uh, here we don't, we're, we're not forced to do, uh, which is nice mm-hmm. because if you just want to sell, you can sell. I wouldn't be here if we were forced to do it. Yeah. 
Same. I would have that I would have ran. Same. Um, but if if you want to build a team, you could build a team too, and that's great because you're you have to make sure other people are being successful to actually profit something from that as well. So it's not like you're just signing people up and, and getting a bonus. Yeah, you, you don't know? get paid if they sign up. No. You get paid if they get paid. Yeah, I, I lose money when I bring people on. Yeah. You know, um, it's just a matter of like how fast they decide whether it's the right fit for them or not. You mm -hmm. know, so it's also building an environment where it's going to push out the people who aren't serious faster, you know, because you can spend a lot of time on people that you shouldn't. Um, sometimes, you know, you got to make sure you're not more invested in them than they are themselves sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, for the right person. But, um, yeah, as far as that goes, I mean, I, I love where when I first started, I was in person in Seattle and I got kind of sick of it, you know, knock on a door, where's your vax card? Where's your mask? You know, this is around after COVID, COVID right? Yeah. So then I was like, okay, you know, uh, let me just try phone sales. And this is when it was still kind of new in yeah. FFL. Um, so the first like six months was a lot of like figuring out what to say and this and that, but I, I think it's definitely, it works for the right person who's disciplined, um, enough to like work from anywhere. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, dude, this is a huge opportunity. You could build a virtual team Yeah, that can work from anywhere. Yeah. And Call it's cool too, because like, it, it's actually like easier to train people virtual than it is in person because they could be on the phone with a client and you could literally be the court, like the coach yeah. in the quarterback's ear yeah. guiding yeah. them through it, you know? So car sales, they could do this. They could start part-time if they want to see if it's real. Yeah. Real estate sales, which real estate did some funky stuff with commissions that I'm sure is going to affect people or make, not make their lives easy. Yeah. Loan officers, mm -hmm. their interest rates are super high. I don't think a bunch of people are getting loans or refinancing yeah. from what I've heard. Solar, uh, solar. California just solar. shut down. Did made some regulation that messed solar up. Yep. Huge opportunity there. Very similar selling styles. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, dude, all these, all this stuff. Pest control. Mm -hmm. Like dudes that are door knocking their faces off every day. They could compare. I would at least open up the door to comparing. Um, yeah. Or just gr someone working at the grocery store like I was, or Uber, mm -hmm. or yeah. whatever. You don't have to have sales experience. Some of those people have been our best people. They are, dude. They're learning from a clean slate. Yeah. You know, which is cool. Yeah, no baggage. But I, I, what attracted me also to life insurance is it's one of the most stable businesses out there. Yeah. It's not like dependent on the economy. It's been around 100 plus years. Financial services right below entertainment, which is like, I'm not going to the NFL anytime soon, so that's yeah. not going to make the yeah, rich, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it makes the most millionaires each year, financial services. Yeah. So I want to fact check that, though, because I've heard that. But yeah. I, I do want to fact check that. Yeah. Someone might have paid Forbes to say that. I yeah. Don't know. Yeah. But, but let's talk about the stability. Mutual yeah. of Omaha. They were around for the Spanish flu, mm -hmm. World War One, World War II, uh, COVID, and some other, cra some other crazy events that I don't remember. Yeah. National Life Group, which I love telling customers. One of their customers, one of their death claims was paid out from someone on the Titanic. Wow. So think about, like, dude, the history of these companies and then the regulation of the amount of reserves they have to have in order to stay in business. That way it doesn't collapse. Yep. And then the reinsurance that they have to have to make sure that everybody's covered and then makes it a really safe, stable industry to be in. Yeah. That's that's what I love about it. I mean, this last three years since I've been doing this, I've made more money than I've ever made in my life in probably the worst economic time in a while, in my lifetime at least. So when times are good, times are going to be really good for everyone that's really buckled down the last three years and I've done what they're supposed to do, you know. That's crazy, dude. Good for you, man. Yeah. And How'd that feel? feels great. It feels great. I, I like it way more than the car business because the main – problem I was having was getting inventory like at auctions and private party sellers because when the economy is bad people are keeping their same car they're not going out and buying a new car in most cases right so like I was when I saw that you guys had unlimited leads I was like perfect you know well dude I was also like health has something to do with people wanting to get insurance right mm-hmm 
because a lot of people call in, they have a health condition, and then they call in, they're like, I need to get insurance. It makes it a really valuable to them at that point in time. Um, but dude, even I was just reading up on the rapid increase of certain um, diseases in the US. It's like, dude, insur- people need insurance. Mm. Yeah. And our job is literally just to help them get what they want yeah. with a bunch of companies. We already know. I mean, a, co- a bunch of companies that we just get to shop their rate for them that are all well known Mutual of Omaha, Transamerica, John Hancock, all these big name companies, and find what works for them. Yeah. And in most business, I mean, all the money's made in the middle, you know. And what about uh, how quickly someone can get paid? Yeah. Um, I mean, one to four business days, four business days max after the uh, policy gets approved and the first premium is drafted. Yeah. And you get a nine month advance on that in most cases. Um, I do tell new people it's a form of an unsecured loan. Yeah, it so is. So if something happens, then you have to write over that business or pay it back. Yeah. You know, me personally, I think it's better just to write over it. Yeah. Because, you know, you're not spending any money from your own business bank account for that. So that's huge. Cool. Well, if you're interested in working with Family First Life or Logan, um, hit them up on Instagram. Yep. And thank you for coming in and sharing, bro. Looking forward to see what you do in the next couple of years. Thanks for having me. See you guys.